I was born in this country, but my parents came to the UK um, in the 1960s. My dad in 1966, and my um, mother followed a year later in 1967. Um, and my father I actually travelled by ship to the United Kingdom. It took 21 days from then Bombay, Bombay, now Mumbai. And, and what's really interesting is that my dad didn't know the city from Mumbai at all. He just, that was the point of his departure. And he's never been back, and he's never going to go back to India now. And I went to the Gateway of India in Mumbai a couple of years ago uh, on Christmas Day, and a poem kind of flowed out of that experience. It's called Gateway of India. It's early. The traffic volume is still low. Kismet coaches are arising as I pass the sweepers along the railings. The chai brothers stacking their perspex cups, smoking their morning beads. And I pass the still sleeping bodies. A man using the foam of his flip flops for a pillow. A few beggars rising from the smoke. Around the perimeter, the snack shops are selling juice, phone cars, and triple blade razors. I step aside to avoid the speedy boys in their brown and cream uniforms, their wire trolleys straining under the weight of the packages. The ladies' entrance is closed this morning, so I join the one easy-moving queue behind a woman wearing a death-before-decaf t-shirt, an after-security incongruously step on a little patch of carpet that welcomes me into the square. Under the triumphant arch, a row of apertures are filled with pigeons standing like sentry guards, each of their ragged backs against the Arabian Sea. These most revolutionary of birds are as maddening here as in any other city. The birds own this place. The pigeons and the gulls are swarm in batches, not unlike starlings over the turrets of the old basalt gate the harbour water and around the hotel. The Taj has erected anti-roosting spikes, every nesting, every conceivable device, but these birds are insistent as the Indian sun, which now just robes itself from the clouds, as the Mumbai morning comes fully into the square. The last battalion of British troops left this spot in 1948. Two decades later, and less than a mile from here, my father set sail on an Italian ship. So. Actually, an important poem um, in, in the book itself. It's got it has three poems that um, basically arise out of um, the Mahabharat, um, and really it's me trying to inhabit the voice of this very important character, Draupadi. I have to say, I think the epics are really important. Homer, the Mahabharat, Sophocles, these ancient texts remind us that we need to historicise that we've been here before. And the Mahabharat, of course, is so underread in the West. So, and it also has the most interesting female characters in it. So this is called Draupadi's Hair. After the, the disrobing of Draupadi in Kaurava's palace from the Mahabharat. Draupadi's Hair. It was like the first time I closed my eyes properly. Unbidden, I opened them again when I entered the walls of the old city. Sorrow heavy, I could barely walk through the chest my weeds, the women flinching when they saw my unbound hair. The smell of the palace was still in my hair. They led me to their homes, their eyes never left me. I was saved by these women. They found me a place to lie, and again I suffered, fevered for days and sleepwalked alone around the skein of the old city. You may have heard tales of the old city. Its breath so toxic I hid in the long hairs of the boar tree. Girls pitied me, 
walked away, shaking their heads, averting their eyes. I swear I'll never crave anything again. How to explain to innocence and women? Pinch out my tears, I say to the women, my anger is a yellow lake. The starved city can't contain it again. Five sons, five brothers never reach my hair. The tips of the mountains blind the eyes of the sky, and I need to rehearse and walk. Long fingers of grief hold me as I walk around my feathered shadow. The women's stories flow fast and true. Within their eyes are tiny blessings. I will leave the city when the new rain comes and rinses my hair, soaking the forever sloping stone again. Look, I've begun to turn porous again. Mothers tell us to dream corpses that walk through rice pale faces, and as for my hair, never speak of it to another woman. I'm a queen with a song for this city, which jangles under the weight of its eyes. The women of this city help me wear my delicate, wistful wings again. One stops to lift the hair from my eyes. Slightly different turn. Um, last year, um, I noticed on something a news report when I was uh, writing about inside the book. When you're inside the book, everything speaks to you. Um, conversations on buses, news reports, um, things in the garden. And I kind of imbibe all that and transmute it into the work. Um, anyway, so there was a little um, news report and there were these incredible images of these women in Mexico dressed as brides um, tying themselves to trees. It was kind of like an eco-protest. Anyway, it was, it was a gift for a poet. In Mexico, the women are marrying trees. Last night, I went all the way with the tree. I headed to the forest, past the lake, the thicket of wild junipers, blossoms to a young and mute, the insensible fungi on the floor of the vast forest leaves. The others came, slipped in like silent emissaries towards the dark, colossal frame, the waiting grooms. So many trees, we sighed. So much loneliness. In the golden hour, we parted the bark, then married them. If you press your ear to its body, the oak, it doesn't sing, it rings. You follow the sound deep inside. The speech is always fettered to the root. We rage all night, our impatient husbands still ringing out. Yeah. Um, I will just read a poem from um, Small Hands, and it's a guzzle. There, there are, I'm in love with the guzzle form. There are two kind of mirror guzzles in um, this book, and then a couple of guzzles in the, the new book, too. Such a wonderful form, so many opportunities to use music in and to sort of score the voice. Guzzle, it's a love poem. Has a little epigraph. I thought you my bird and built you a nest in my heart, Arab saying. Breathe me in this disheveled night, I go unnoticed. The airs turn strange and solid, but only I will notice. If I allow beams of light to pass through the pinholes of my torso, and if light strikes the wall on the other side, would you notice? Tonight your three parts sod and one part sandalwood dust. I keep catching your scent by the window, I always notice. My words pile up like topics on the point of my tongue. What passes for transparency are those things you don't notice. I seal Robin's face and sketch powder down feather seal. My pocket keeps the pulsing nest the creatures never even notice. If you could let me bangle my arms around you, rain would fall. It would speck my lips, my open fingers, then you'll notice. Instead, my eye remains locked in the platinum part of the floor.
flower, the highest branches are the only living things to notice. There's this real urge to um, not to avoid all the tropes like pomegranates and saris and mangoes. <laughs> and then you kind of feel, well, actually, you know, I want to go to those tropes and sort of subvert them in some way. So um, this is kind of my, Brex my Brexit poem. <laughs> and, uh, and it's shaped like a little mango. Um, it's a tiny little poem. Um, and it's kind of a little epigraph, which is in the age of reinvigorated nationalism. How does the mango fare? <laughs> the mango. Mango sits on my desk, quietly, orangey, pinkish with belly, discreetly carrying a stone of shame, like undancing mango, not hurting anyone. <laughs> So first, to just say that, yeah, push one thing. I mean, I, I haven't met him up there either. Um, should I get closer to the mic? Yeah, I haven't met Push one thing either. But I've read um, Delhi um, about 25 years ago. And I, I just remember the exhilaration I had reading that book about the way he took ownership of the English language, the way he kind of you know, made it his own in a kind of very feisty, saucy, uh, political, edgy way. So I kind of so I have a huge respect for his work. Uh, Going back to Mona mentioned epics and the importance of the epics, I, 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 as Rachel mentioned, I've done a version of the Ramayana. Um, and I knew of the kind of Punjabi version, I guess, from my parents growing up. And, I, and for my, my version, I sort of looked at different versions of the Ramayana, you know, translation versions, uh, whether it be Filipino, Malaysian, Thai, Burmese, and various versions. So I tried to get the energy of some of those stories in, as well as the puppet show, the street performance, that kind of general energy of the Ramayana. So it goes on for a while. So I'll just read one little section about the marriage. I'll sort of read an extract, a section of Ram and Sita's marriage scene, just to give you a sort of flavour of what it's after. So I'll just call it Chudamani section. Is there anything gaudier, more glorious, or heartbreaking than a good old fashioned wedding? The husband will henceforth be nourished by a wife, but the bridal parents must relinquish the breakfast hugs a daughter has daily blessed upon them. A wedding is sighs. A wedding is laughter. A wedding is footloose, arms in the air, clamorous enjoyment. A wedding is Rama's father receiving a jolly invite from King Janaka for a bride and groom embarking on their belle vie. So kindly come with all your peoples to celebrate on the sandy streets of Ayodhya, on the streets of Matilla, who is not hearing the elephant loud trumpeting? All you beauties, please be coming by and by to party, party, and party. <laughs> Suddenly, the whole of Yodhya on the streets ready for the trek to the kingdom of Kasala. The gathering can be summarized by admiring the youth. When a boy fell off his horse and into the planking and into the arms of a honey smelling lover, the lover didn't sting him with a slap. Instead, they spun themselves into laugh aloud gupsha and would not need parting. Couples in a strop soon patched up, and dumbbell armed lads stood by a river offering to carry across their dreamboat, the dreamboat that sought no better transportation. All listened to proud talk about wondrous Rama, winning the most beauteous woman, as proved by the ultimate praise that this Sita had, start, had thighs shapely as elephant trunks. The two kings met, and in an instant, two powerful states were bonded. For marriage is not about two people, but about two tribes forging fellowship, couples commingling their communities, so affection's commerce is forever being overlapped and broadened in the great flow of humanity at one. Janaka held a round pearl on a gold leaf 
the Chudamani. Then he placed it in Sita's hair above her forehead. The Chudamani was a crown serving the elect face. When Sita was alongside Rama, Janaka spoke. Here is my Sita. In giving Sita, I give my ground. Look at her, and never tire of looking at her. Take her hand in your hand, and evermore she will walk alongside you, as your own shadow walks alongside you. On the marriage platform, Rama's heart-stopping moment, he observed for the first time he observed for the first time his bride. He who had lifted a godly bow became woozy with fear and wonder. Would this be the beauty of the world he had observed that day on her balcony? As he lifted the veil, to his great release, he saw once again the face that had completed his being, now completes his being once again as he hoped it would forever more. I'll move on from the epic to I'll read a couple of other poems. Um, I'll read one about the kind of British Empire. I wrote my, one of my books, wrote a few poems about children of the empire, and partly thinking about my own birth here, and thinking about the kind of Ill illegitimate children of the empire, you know, the kind of that liaison between uh, the men of the empire and the women, that kind of pleasure that went on. So I wrote a poem about the sports, the luxury and the pleasure of the empire, um, and then that dark side at the end. I've got loads of words from Hodgson Jobson, you know that Victorian um, dictionary in a sense of um, it, which I'll be in the you know, sort of words that are compiled and sort of turned into English words, all the way the English spoke them. So I used some of those in this book, knowing I knew some of those words from Punjabi, but I spelt them in the Hodgson Jobson way and so on. So we've got like, things like goody, like goodies for the girls, I'm sure some of you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'll just read it here. So it's called call it, this, this Be the Bakka Verse. Ah, oh, the Raj, our mother incarnate, Victoria and Peratrix, rules a sceptered sphere, overseeing legions of maidens, fishing fleets, that break the waves to net the love of a heaven Etonian. Fates on lawns with matching whacking banks, or dances by moonlight at the Viceroy, the Viceroy's ball. The barrack room bara pegs of brandy barney and pink gin, and toddy to do like flappings on Jaldi Pankawala for six meal days, including tipping with humps and peacock and tongue. The lock stock and bobbing palanquins for summers on Gothic verandas where dawn Himalayas through Pubong or Uti mist for Housey Housey and hammocks under the Milky Way. Tally ho in Topi of Kaki with slagger stick for bobbery cigars and by Amritsar what a 12 ball Hollis Howder from Howders for bang bang bagging photogenic tigers, panthers, leopards, black bucks and bustards and Kipling or Tatler to hand at Tollygunge. The rum-twirling, sailor-curved mustachios, lavish zananas, behind bazaars, with a fruity hookah for the breathless notch. The notch that leads to the ayahs and passerby goodies, snookered for sahib sport that ends in a hushed-up, bestie births of half-breed bastards growing up Curse as mad dogs and vagabonds in a jolly good lingam land overflowing with hops and hop jobsons of holly and opium and spice and all the gems of the shafted earth. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to clear my throat. <laughs> I'm sorry about the photo, by the way. It's my summer look, but it's kind of gone a bit wrong. I think I sent the wrong photo to the organisers. I have got one with a t-shirt, but um, the only problem is that the only, the only other photo I've got is from about 10 years ago and I was so much younger. <laughs> my hair's all gone grey since, I can't really use that anymore. It looks like a vanity project, doesn't it, when you put up an old photo of yourself. Okay, I'm going to finish with another difficult poem about the Punjab. So I'm just partly thinking about pre-partition pre Punjab and modern Punjab and just playing on Punjab with the word Punjab. I know Arb is river, but for the poem I imagine Jab means river. 
because I was born here, so I don't know Kentucky. <laughs> and I've got the refrain going in the poem. I don't know if it'll make any sense, but I'll read it. you get a flavour. get a flavour of my take. So I'll call it the, the Punjab. The Punjab. Not the, just Punjab. Was there once before partition a Punjab whole? A Panjab of Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, anything. Our Punjabis all partitioned. Are they puja pushers? How many times have my punj land picked off so bank after river bank got flagged by a clan? To, pay the, to play the pipes of a punja mentalist. Must I pin a badge? Must I drop my pants? Must I join a junta and jab, jab, jab for my punja? The old man river calls you loud and long from a land he loved in a lullaby. You say Punjab, we say Punjab. It's our land of five wide rivers. If it's fine for the bunch and it's jar for a river, you'll never take me from ek jar, door jar, ten jar, jar jar, bun jar. <laughs> what a jape. Not a jape. I'm the last of the line. On the final day of my marbab, I must palm their ashes down the jar and watch them panjiring to their Orm land. The old man river calls you loud and long from a land he loved in an alibi, where the rainbow glows from a farm nearby. Do Punjabs leave Punjab to spice the Baldi of the work, work, work world? All I know is my people deserted Punjab because they're penny puja pushers. They sold me on the wing till I was anybody's stand up, pop it on Pete, come Jalunda Johnny. But Ekajar is a row row your boat gently down the stream from Thamesjar. Ah, oh, honey, let's bathe in the waters of my ancestors where you can pan at my jab or jab for my man jab. <laughs> That old man river calls you loud and long from a land that you loved in a lullaby where the rainbow glows from a farm nearby but you'll never know the land or the song. Young Punglanders, so many acres in the Jab land the Jameen, the Gi, the Jagiri or Gore all the Jagirs of gold in our names are ours for the taking. I declare we're the pun of our Marba. Take a pan and a lawman and jump aboard for your unplucked jutland, your bee blade industry. Look at you jump, you got to well jump, my huckleberry friend. Look at you jumping and jabbing your song down the jobs, going merrily. Ek jab, door jab, den jab, jar jab, bun jab. <laughs> I start with one called, they'll say she must be from another country. When I can't comprehend why they're burning books or closing borders, when they can't bear to look at God's own nakedness, when they burn the film and got the seats to stop the play, and I ask why, they just smile and say, she must be from another country. When I speak on the phone and the vowel sounds are off, when the consonants are hard and they should be soft, They'll catch on at once, they'll pin it down, they'll explain it right away to their own satisfaction, they'll cut their tongues and say, she must be from another country. <laughs> when my mouth goes up instead of down, when I wear a tablecloth to go to town, when they suspect I'm black or think I'm gay, they won't be surprised, they'll purse their lips and say, she must be from another country. <laughs> Maybe there is a country where all of us live, all of us freaks who aren't able to give our loyalty to pompous fools, the crooks and thugs who wear the uniform that gives them the right to wave a flag, puff out their chests, put their feet on our necks and break their own rules. But from where we are, it doesn't look like a country. It's more like the cracks that grow between borders behind their backs. That's where I live, and I'd be happy to say 
I never learned their customs. I don't remember their language or know their ways. I must be from another country. My parents never spoke about partition and what happened in partition. I think that's true of many of us. And it was only later that I began to piece together some of what happened from what they had said and from what I heard from places like Kushwan Singh's train to Pakistan. Gardi Aave. It happened like this. Their country slipped out of their hands and broke like a cup or an earthen pot. They never spoke as if they remembered the shape it used to have. They never cried over spilled blood, at least not in front of us. It was as if you reassured a guest, oh, don't mind that. It was only a cheap old cup. And anyway, broken china brings good luck. And a whole generation swallowed the nightmares that sounded like trains. Gaddi Aave Deshinde, Gaddi Aave Deshinde. When the train came into its destination, the station drank up the names of their aunts and uncles, their neighborhoods and cities, and our mothers and fathers swallowed the nightmares that sounded like trains. Gandhi Aveditation Day, Gandhi Aveditation Day. They swallowed the things they remembered, and the cousins who had gone away with the ghosts of the place that broke with the cup. One day, when my mother was planting potatoes in another country, she dug up a fragment of china and looked at it as if she remembered something that had never been spoken, something she dug out of the nightmares, something unbroken. Gati Ali Deshante, Gati Ali Deshante. She said the neighbors from the other side were kind. They took her in and hid her. They pretended she was one of their own until they could send her home. Gadi Aave Deshante, Gadi Aave. To the country with a different name. To the station on the other side, on another train. Uh, I grew up in Glasgow and my father always was very proud of fitting in with local habits and customs. And he was especially proud of speaking the language like a local. <laughs> so that, I found that very embarrassing. <laughs> so this is what Jodri Sher Mubarak looks at the loch. We used to go for picnics to Loch Lomond. Light shakes out the dish like sky and scatters the water with sequins. Look! Hen, says my father, Loch Lomond, as if it were all his doing, as if he owned it. Laird of Lomond, laird of the language. He's proud to say hen, and even more loch, with an och, not an och, to speak proper Glaswegian like a true born Scot. And he makes the right sound at the back of the throat because he can say hush and hwa and chamosh because the sounds for happy and dream are the words that swim in the water for him. So he says it again. Hen, look, the loch. <laughs> I'll uh, read you a sonnet as you're such a lovely audience. It's like a love poem. Um, and for many years after my husband Simon died, I tried to write the dream where he had come back. And I found this very hard. Uh, somehow the, the dream didn't work in all the poems that I tried. But when I came to write a sonnet, somehow the formality of the sonnet allowed the dream to be written and it, and it had permission in a way to sit in the middle of the sonnet. The trick. In a wasted time, 
It's only when I sleep that all my senses come awake. In the wake of you, let day not break. Let me keep the scent, the weight, the bright of you. Take the countless hours and count them all night through till that time comes when you come to the door of dreams carrying oranges that cast a glow up into your face. Greedy for more than the gift of seeing you, I lean in to taste the color, kiss it off your offered mouth. For this, for this, I fall asleep in haste, willing to fall for the trick that tells the truth, that even your shade makes darkest absence bright, that shadows live wherever there is light. And Hiraith is one of those almost untranslatable Welsh words. It means something in the direction of a longing to return to something that's no longer there. And Bombay, as we all know here, is a city whose name has been changed. Hiraith, old Bombay. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe if it had not shut down. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe for the best view and the worst food in town. <laughs> we would have drunk flat beer and cream soda and sweated on plastic chairs at the Nas Cafe. We would have looked down over the dusty trees at cars creeping along Marine Drive round the bay to Eros Cinema and the talk of the town. We would have held hands in the Nas Cafe over sticky rings on the tabletop, knee locked on knee at the Nas Cafe, while we admired the distant stock exchange, Taj Mahal Hotel, Sasundok, Gateway. We would have nursed a drink at the Nas Cafe, and you would have stolen a kiss from me. We would have lingered in the Nas Cafe till the day slid off the map into the Arabian Sea. I would have taken you to Bombay if its name had not slid into the sea. I would have taken you to the place called Bombay if it were still there. And if you were still here, I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe. Thank you. And I will end with this one, which is my poem for Kushvan. Kushvan was the first editor who ever published me in his amazing uh, Illustrated Weekly of India. And this is called, his own title, Not a Nice Man to Know. <laughs> Acid-tongued mischief maker, spotlight stealer, story stalker, salt in the wound piss taker, punchline grabbing, headline, headline walker. Not nice, not a nice man to know. Spit in the eye, straight talker, shaker upper, elbow in the ribs, ego breaker, body, shameless gossip monger, whiskey guzzling, guzzle lover. <laughs> not nice, not a nice man to know. Of all the Sikhs, he was sicker, pricker of pride, poker and pecker, away at the accepted order. Sparing neither man nor God, not nice at all, not a nice man to know. <laughs> half his heart in Lahore, half in Amritsar, one foot in Delhi, one in the gutter. Son of a gun and Sasoba Singh, malice towards one and all. If you're not expected, don't ring his bell. <laughs> if you expect to be respected, go to hell. <laughs> Not a nice man to know, I know, but I wish that I had known him longer. And I wish there were more like him in the world. Not nice to know, but they don't grow on trees, people like him. 
So it's worth remembering Khushwan Singh, not us. But he took us all under his wing, the young, the outspoken, the runaways, the rebels and poets, the broken things. And this is why we gather to sing of him. While he is laughing up there, in the place he didn't believe in, drinking a peg or three with the boss, who's still not the boss of him. So here is to the man who we know is not nice to know, but we want to know and go on knowing. Khushman, Khushman, Khushman. So. discussion, the whole range of things. So it's a wonderful time in that sense. I, mean, I went freelance for about a year and a half and I was making a perfectly good living, but I've got a mortgage and children, so I can risk <laughs> continuing that path. But there is enough work, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. I mean, we do a lot of teaching. I, I certainly do a lot of teaching alongside readings as well. I mean, I, I, that's sort of my bread and butter. You know, um, I can't uh, uh, we don't translate our own, but uh, I think, well, I've been translated just last week into Romanian, Italian, there's some German. I don't know about the yeah, others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've had, I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, I, there, there are opportunities, actually, more opportunities to, tra to translate work. And also, uh, there's something else happening as well. It's, a, it's not really translation, more opportunities to work in other forms. So I've worked with dancers, I've worked with artists and painters. And I don't think that was happening, I think, either five years ago. But there seems to be this kind of intertextual thing going on with other forms, which I think is really interesting. Good. <coughs> yes. I, I have a question. Um, you envisage a time in a new future when we'll have an Asian poet laureate in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, it, it, it could happen in 10 years from now, and in fact, uh, both the people on this platform could well be the next story. <laughs> <laughs> or a topic or an idea 
together, which is dear to you, it seems. How do you then um, visualize to which audience or to which group of people this very uh, specific form of self-expression is then going to appeal to? I mean, for me personally, I think uh, India's all your uh, poetry, because I'm, I'm a very political person. So maybe some bit of your poetry resonated with it because it was political. And uh, in your, I mean, uh, for you, Mona, it was a bit about the human rights thing. And ethical. <coughs> so how do you determine uh, what you're going to write about and which part of uh, some people, where is it going to resonate? Um, I don't know about the other poets, but for me, I don't have a destination for my own poetry. If I did, I think I would be uninterested in the poet, the poem arising. So I think also that there is something about a sort of poem's obligation to be what it is. I mean, of course, there are certain things we're interested in, our, in our, which is our experience. We have different experiences, and I have you know, a human rights background, and I've dealt with a teacher, a teacher uh, for a long time, but. That's different. Self-expression is different to what actually lands on the page, which is actually art. So I think you kind of plumb your own depths to first in order to turn that into that experience into something and transmute it onto the page, you know? Because um, I think if it was only self-expression, I'd probably just end up just staying on my, in my journal. But something is done to it in order for it to end up on the page. I think I, I agree with Mona. I think once I've found my own voice, I have to be true to my voice and put what I want to put on paper. But because it's a human voice, in the end, it has to reach other human beings. So whatever the subject, it has to be something that in the end will reach other people as well. It's the, it's the humanity, it's the shared humanity in the voice that finally reaches an audience. But that's not a planned audience. Um, I don't I ask a question. <clears throat> um, I'm Dalti, and it's yes, you both use words from other languages in your pub, in your readings today. And Mona, I don't know whether you do. Do you think being multilingual and certainly having awareness that you know English isn't the only language makes a great difference to the richness that you can bring to English poetry? <laughs> Yeah, I think we're in an interesting phase at the moment. You know, if you think of internet, global, you know, social media, we're exposed to many languages instantaneously, or many different types of Englishes. So, uh, probably a bit like Shakespeare's time, and the language is opening up. I think the language is opening up now. So it's really every poet's responsibility to think of language first. Language is the matter of art. So, the kind of language you use, the way you nuance your diction. Uh, hopefully creates a kind of new type of set of idioms, a new type of um, set of languages, possibilities. Uh, so it's really important to me not to just use words that exist in a dictionary, but words out on the street, and that could be streets of London or streets of wherever else I've been, or the, the streets of my childhood, Punjabi English. And it's really important to me not to sound like an English person. Uh, if I can move off standard English and constantly gesture to a different voice, that feels really important. And uh, I'm sure a Yorkshireman would say the same thing. You know, there are things being brought in from other, from regional languages, from other, all kinds of other experience, which do enrich the, the voice in the poem. But I also think it's important just to put, even if it's not totally understood, 20 years ago when I was putting uh, Hindi or Urdu or Punjabi words into a poem, I refused to let my publisher put in a glossary. I said, let people work out themselves what this word means there. And, they, and they're doing that because people do fill in the gaps themselves. Yeah. Talking about words that don't exist in the dictionary. Can you use the mic? Sorry. It's on, it's on. Oh, hi. Talking about words that don't exist in the dictionary, Punjabi provides an amazingly rich vein of new words that we use every day, but we don't even know exist. How cool are you know, there's always another word to it, not neutral. It's not a word, but it becomes part of the vocabulary. So there are, there's a whole new vein to it. Send them into us, we use them. Words <laughs> <laughs> are thieves, we use everything of this.
I suppose this is more a question for um, maybe anyone else, yes, but maybe you could all answer. And I just wondered if you could say something about um, if you feel that your work is gendered in its reception. And uh, particularly as female poets, I also write poetry, and I just sometimes get very frustrated by um, the perception of female poets versus male poets. Yes, a good question. You see, that there, there were, I suppose there's a time when you begin, when you think, oh goodness, can I say that? I'm, I'm ashamed to say that. I'm embarrassed to say that. Uh, and you, you want to say something quite private and, and, yes, gender. But the thing is that in the end, you have to speak as a human. And, and that has to be understood in that way as well. I don't know what more I would like to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that in 2009. It's a really, really important question. And it's a question that I ask myself an awful lot because even 10 or 20 years ago, there were no, there were hardly any female poets writing. There were very, very few. Um, in the forward anthology of 20 years ago, apparently there were two, two poets, two female poets. And I think there is something about female voices in that space, which has actually historically been a very male space. So there's that. And on top of that, I think that if you are a, a female poet of colour writing, I think that there's nothing much you can do about your reception. There's not much you can do about the reader. All you can do is make sure that you are writing, if you want to write fearlessly, you're able to do that. And, and if you want to investigate the terrain that you want to investigate, you do that in your work. Because actually, all those things about being female and being a colour will be emphasised, overemphasised in the reception. And there's nothing you can do about that at all. So just write. I think we have time for our last question. Or a poem. Or a poem. Poems. Mona, that's okay. Um, yeah. I'm going to have to have a class just a single more poem. I taste it because it might taste of honey. I taste it because my brain is a hive. I taste it because I'm properly assimilated. I taste it because I was an only child and refused to share the oranges in their playground. I taste it because I never travelled. I taste it because I travelled to the frozen tundra of the northern Arctic. I taste it because of the lack. I taste it because of the surplus. I taste it because Auntie Naveen's best friend tasted it and she never looked back. I taste it because I pity it to some degree. I taste it because it smells nice. I taste it because of shavings and bones on the wind. I taste it because it might be like the first time, though it's never like the first time. I taste it because I'm perfumed, shameless, godless. I taste it because I'm curious, because of its integrity, its shape, its asking to be tasted. I taste it because I'm scared. I taste it because I'm, I don't want to be scared anymore. I taste it because I'm gagging on all the departures. I taste it because of salt. I taste it because nothing is as holy as intimacy, because I want to purr and stink inside me. I taste it because I'm on a civilizing mission. I taste it because of Japan. I taste it because I miss the children. I taste it because I tilted the baby last night, gave her a name and forgot it. I taste it because I'm using my verbs. I taste it because this morning I saw the first crocus push through the earth and it was yellow with my tongue. I taste it. Oh. Just a very short poem, it's about five lines. Just about what we make of our parents and their own childhoods. And it's just called Look There, he, sorry, Look There, He Goes Even Now, My Father. Look There, He Goes Even Now, My Father, into some other world. All my life I have been harbour struck, trying to make him appear from wherever he went the years before I was born. Uh, I'm going to read a poem that's made up of things that people actually said, just rearranged a little. And this is a phrase that seems to have stuck in the throat of the English language, so I've just uh, used it. And it keeps reappearing, and then I rewrite uh, the poem a little bit. So this one's called Speech Balloon. The sixth in line to the throne was way beyond thrilled, said the news report, when Meghan delivered a bouncing baby, and people cheered all over the world 
from Milton Keynes to Krakow to Karachi, when the baby's name was revealed to be Archie. <laughs> I'm over the moon, they said, Harry said. I'm over the moon, he said. Bollywood's hottest couple was proud to be blessed by the jubilant father, the superstar. It's a match made in heaven, he said to the press, between two shooting stars with shining careers. And I'm over the moon, of course, he said. I'm over the moon, he said. The Malaysian nation went mad with joy on Independence Day in its 50th year when a doctor come part-time model, a local boy, went up into space in a Russian Soyuz and in zero gravity performed his namaz. All of Malaysia over the moon, they said of the news. 27 million people over the moon. <laughs> it's really quite clear. This condition has spread, it's happening there, it's happening here, it's full blown, grown beyond every border to the furthest corner of every country where English is spoken or English is known. There's no one just satisfied or mildly pleased or chipper or chirpy, contented or cheerful. No one glad or gratified, delighted or jubilant, elated, ecstatic, joyful or grieved. All the happy people have left this world. <laughs> you won't come across them any time soon. And if it's happy sound bites you're looking for, you need to look way over your head. For the words and balloons, to the place where the cow keeps jumping over and over with all the footballers, team managers, and lottery winners, world superstars, heroes, and champions, and legends and lovers and proud moms and dads and the whole of Malaysia <laughs> over the moon, over the moon, over the moon, over the moon. <laughs> So 